Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. And in this one, we're looking at Chapter 2 of the book called Beginnings, and the third part of it about childbirth, in which we're going to look at events uh, that indicate when a child's ready to be born, the stages of childbirth, and methods, and um, things that can happen during childbirth. And so let's start... Let's start by looking at the countdown of events that can lead to childbirth. So there are several signs indicating that a baby is ready for birth. First of all, the head of the fetus can settle in the mother's pelvis. That's called dropping, and it can give the mother a sensation of actually feeling lighter. Then, after that, in our blue square, you can have what are called Braxton Hicks contractions, and those can increase in frequency as the pregnancy progresses towards delivery. Next one, in the uh, red triangle, you can have a day or so before the labor begins, you get increased pelvic pressure from the fetus, and that can actually rupture some blood vessels in the canal, in the birth canal, so blood appears in vaginal secretions. And then next, in the green, we have mucus that has plugged the cervix and protected the uterus from infection. That becomes dislodged, and about 1 in 10 women has a rush of warm liquid from the vagina at this time. Now, this liquid is amniotic fluid, and its discharge, and, excuse me, and its discharge means that the amniotic sac has burst. And so the sac usually doesn't burst until the end of the first stage of childbirth, which we'll look at in a minute. But other signs that um, the child is imminent, about to come out, can include dig indigestion and diarrhea, ache in the small of the back, cramps. Um, anyhow, it becomes clear. The next thing is the actual stages of childbirth. Here we've got a little cross-section of the mom. And um, what you see here are the, the major stages. First, during the first stage, uterine contractions efface and dilate the cervix. So it starts to open up. And a woman can be prepped in this stage for uh, childbirth, and the fetus is monitored for a heart rate. They stick a little monitor. And this is the longest stage of the labor, the, uh, the uterine contractions. The second stage involves the movement of the baby into the birth canal. So you see we have the descent uh, in number two and ends with the birth of the baby. Uh, the physician can perform an episiotomy on the mother where they actually uh, cut open to make the, uh, the passage a little larger or as the baby's head is crowned. So that's when the head first comes out through the vaginal canal. Um, then you see uh, in number four here on the bottom left that the first, the front shoulder, the anterior shoulder comes out and then the posterior, the second shoulder, comes out. And then in the third stage of labor, that's when the placenta uh, separates from the uterine wall and comes out through the birth canal as well, sometimes called the afterbirth. Now, when looking at methods of childbirth, there's a fair amount of variation on this. A contemporary American childbirths usually take place in a hospital where physicians use a, a whole variety of methods to protect the mother and the child from complications. And there, but again, there's a lot of variation. People have their choices, especially if the if they're if the baby's low risk. There's a lot of options here. Now, some of the things can include uh, getting anesthetics, like an epidural. Um, you can get general or local anesthetics. You can uh, use Lamas. You can have a, a doula uh, help out with this. And now, and in certain cases, you can have cesarean sections. Now, what's funny is that cesarean sections have typically been reserved for high risk cases. What's ironic is that uh, cesarean sections now account for about 30% of births in the U.S., and I don't know what the criteria are now for determining high risk, but um, apparently 30% of the people meet those criteria of one kind or another. So now we can talk about some of the birth problems. And then, for instance, one of the problems you can have during birth is anoxia, and that means without oxygen. Uh, you also have hypoxia, which means under oxygen, where the baby doesn't receive enough oxygen in the uterus to develop properly. Uh, you also have a problem here if a uh, if a child is a breech birth, and that means that they're they're coming out the feet first, the bottom first. It does happen um, that they can their body can press against the umbilical cord during the birth canal, and they can actually not have oxygen during much of the delivery, uh, which can be a major problem. And Prenatal oxygen deprivation is a serious issue. It can lead to uh, impairments in the development of the central nervous system. It can lead to cognitive problems. It can lead to problems with memory and spatial relations. It can lead to motor uh, problems. It can lead to psychological disorders. And so it's a serious issue. Now we can look at some other things that happen, mostly with preterm and low birth weight infants. Now, there's many risks associated with prematurity, which means before 38 weeks. Uh, after that is considered... 
not not preterm anymore, and and also with low birth weight babies. First, a child as small as six pounds is considered within the normal birth weight range, but children do uh, and can come much smaller. So the lower a child's birth rate, especially when they're below six pounds, you have increased risk. Um, you have that they generally fare poorly on measures of neurological development and cognitive functioning throughout school years. Also. Um, the lower the birth weight, the greater the risks for uh, problems with motor development and severe disabilities uh, corresponding to the deficiency of, of birth weight. And then the last thing we want to talk about right here is maternal and child mortality. Now, this means that people actually die in the process. Um, I was mentioning in class the other day that while many procedures are, are dangerous, people talk about abortions and that they are dangerous because they are but simply giving birth is a dangerous procedure as well. And so what you find here is that um, a lot of children can die in the process of birth and a lot of mothers can die in the process of birth. Now, um, according to UNICEF, um, six out of the seven newborn deaths are directly attributable to one of uh, three major causes. You can have serious infections, and that it can include sepsis or blood poisoning. You can have, uh, it can also include pneumonia or tetanus, you get diarrhea. You can also have asphyxia, the lack of oxygen, and just uh, also things generally associated with preterm birth. Now, fortunately, mortality rates have decreased dramatically over the last few decades, um, you know, falling to a tenth or a thirtieth of, of what they used to be, although there's still very substantial variation between countries. Um, you get take countries like, for instance, Japan and Sweden. They typically have the lowest mortality rates, the fewest uh, deaths of mother and children in the process. Whereas countries like Somalia and Afghanistan um, have rates that can be 50 or 60 times higher. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of variation. Now the United States, fortunately, has a low maternal mortality rate, not the lowest, but we have a low maternal mortality rate during childbirth and infant mortality. In any case, there are risks associated with it, but you see that there have been so many improvements that it is becoming uh, more children are able to be delivered, more children who maybe would have died in the past are able to survive, and given appropriate treatments, they're able to thrive. And the same thing goes in terms of mother's recovery from the process, really a trauma of childbirth, and that really gets you ready for the things we're going to talk about in the next chapter, which is about the infant's development.